now in the giving of our tithe and of our offering. And I'll ask, if they would, to put our dedication up on the screen. There are the various ways you can give. If you didn't come prepared to give this morning, you can go online, International Church SC. You can use your mobile app, or, of course, you can give. We still take cash, checks, and all of these things as well. Um, Would you say with me this dedication over your tithe and offering as our ushers come to serve you? The curse broken. How many of you had the curse broken out of your life? That's part of what happens on the encounter, right? And that's part of what happens when we give our tithe and offering. Let's say this aloud together. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Jesus, by an act of your grace, you left the riches of heaven to become poor. Then you broke the curse of poverty by wearing the crown of thorns on your brow. By your grace, I am rich, which means I have a full supply of love, help, and finances. I am no longer needy because your promise is that the blessings of the Lord makes me rich and he adds no sorrow to it. I enjoy these benefits Through the giving of my tithes and offerings, may your name be blessed. Amen. May the Lord bless you and grant everything you've said to come to pass as you give to him today. Thank you so much for your giving. How many of you have a bulletin? Right? Let me ask you to get it out, and you're going to see printed on there is my message this morning, and it's got a simple formula for success in life. And notice it just says A plus B equals C. That leads to D. I, you, I don't know about you, but I love formulas. You know, cause you, you know what I'm saying? Because once you learn a formula for something, you know what I mean? Then you don't have to try to remember all kind of details. You just go back to the formula, right? How many of you remember this formula here? Yeah. I can't explain it, but I know it's the most popular formula. I don't, know, I don't understand how energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. I, I, maybe Timothy, I could get him to come up here and explain it to us, but, but no? Yeah, it's just... It's a, it's a popular formula, but who can understand it, you know? Or I remember when I was in high school, how many of you remember this one? The Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? But, you know, I, can, I always struggled, even though I always struggle with math. I still do. But uh, uh, these formulas, you know, they, they work. They help us remember things. But I like, let me make this clear. I like simple formulas. I like formulas like this. If A equals B, then B equals A. <laughs> now you're talking my level. Yeah. 
This is the kind of formula I like. Or I like formulas like this. Lemon plus honey and hot water helps soothe your throat. That's a good formula, right? Well, today I'm going to be talking to you about a simple formula for success in life. It's printed there in your bulletin. And I want to say up front, it's not original with me. I actually received this from a man who had been a chaplain in the prison by the name of David Bowen. And uh, he had been a prison, a prison chaplain. He had been a prison in the chaplain. He had been a chaplain in the prison for over 30 years. And he shared this simple formula. And when I was studying Acts 24, I saw it there in Acts 24. So I want you to turn with me as we continue our uh, adventures in the book of Acts. Open up your Bibles or your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 24. And uh, didn't Pastor Rick do a great job preaching last week? Wow. Man, I listened to that message. I got jacked up in the airport, man. I was in trouble. I couldn't shout. There was all these people around me. Uh, maybe I should have. I don't know. But they probably would have drugged me off the, the place. But the last time I preached, if you remember, uh, Paul had been arrested. The Jews tried to kill him. The Romans arrested him. The Jews had a plot to kill him again. So the Romans took him up to uh, this guy named Felix up in Caesarea, and we picked the story up there. Even though I'm going to focus on the formula, I still think it's important for us to understand where Paul's at in this story so that uh, we don't lose sight of that as we continue moving on. Now, after five days, because it was about a five-day journey from Jerusalem to Caesarea, so Paul had gotten there. They had to wait for Ananias, the high priest, and them to get there so they could have this trial, if you would. Now, after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain orator, or you could probably better say a lawyer by the name of Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity, is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. I can almost hear him now, can't you? It's almost like he's got marbles in his mouth. We accept it as always in all places, most noble Felix, with great thankfulness. (laughs) He's full of hot air is what he is. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him through yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so, meaning the high priest and the Sanhedrin members that had come with him. Verse 10, Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. By this I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hoped in God that they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men." Now, after many days, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, 
and in the midst which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before their counsel, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you to this day. Now, let me just pause. How many of you remember that when Paul stood before the Sanhedrin, he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Remember? The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, so he said, I'm here because of the resurrection of the dead, and he caused there to be a division among the two. So here Paul admits, if there's anything I've done wrong, that's the only thing I've done wrong. But he said, I still believe in the resurrection of the dead because he believed in the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Let's continue on. Verse 22. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to, and to provide or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith in Christ. So you understand now the governor is with his wife, who is a Jewish woman, and he wants to hear privately what Paul has to say about Jesus. Verse 25. Now, as he, being Paul, reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid. Here's this mighty man, this governor, this man that has power to tell the centurions and those that are over legions, over thousands of soldiers in the Roman infantry to do something, and they do it. Here's this great man of power. He is afraid. And he answered, go away from me. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Verse 26, meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. And all the saints of God said, amen Amen and amen. Now, essentially what you see here in this is a trial. It is like a court proceeding. And on one side of the courtroom, you have Ananias, you have the high priest, you have some of the leaders from the Uh, Sanhedrin that have come up with him, but now they have also hired a big shot Philadelphia lawyer by the name of Tertullus who knew the Roman law well and could speak in an oratory style in such a way to impress the governor Felix. And Tertullus begins to make his case against Paul at this trial And he begins with flattery and lies. Flattery and lies. How do we know they're lies? Because of what he said weighed against history. You see, um, uh, Felix had actually risen from a slave to become governor, and he ruled with a very strong and brutish hand. It is known through history that he had had thousands of Jews killed and had looted their homes. He had not caused the Jewish nation to prosper as Tertullus was promoting before him in that moment. He was trying to flatter and trying to move the governor. But what he was doing, he was lying. And not only did he lie to him about his governorship, but he continued to lie as he spoke about Paul. He made several accusations against Paul. 
He charged Paul with being a plague. In other words, he was trying to paint Paul as being a political dissident, as somebody that was a political threat to Rome. He said that Paul belonged to a sect. He was a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. Now, what you have to understand is that Nazareth was seen as a despised place at this time. How many of you remember they said of Jesus, has anything good ever come out of Nazareth? Right? So Nazareth, to be a Nazarene, to be a leader of the sect of the Nazarene, they were trying to paint him in a negative image when they said these words. Then he said that he had had a worldwide influence. Now, this was actually an underhanded compliment because it demonstrated the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul was having. And even the Romans and the Jews were recognizing that the message of the gospel was spreading all over the world. I want you to know today that despite all that we're seeing happening in the media and in the news, there are still Christians in every nation of the world. And there are many that are being persecuted by their faith. We don't know it, but in places like North northern Nigeria and places like India, they are killing and they are burning and looting churches. You never hear about it on the news, but there are people that believe in the gospel message of Jesus Christ that are still willing to give their lives. Do you realize that the word in the Greek for witness is actually the same word martyr? And until we get to the place in the church again that we are willing to lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel, if it costs us our jobs, if it costs us our standing in the community, if it costs us being laughed at by our friends, uh, we've got to stand uh, up for the truth again because the message of the gospel is still alive uh, and well uh, in the world today. And we cannot but help but speak the truth. Jesus said, you don't take a light and put it under a bushel, but you let that light shine And we've got to be light in the darkness like the song we sang about today. Amen? And so he said that he was having a worldwide impact. And then he brought up the charges that he had blasphemed or that he had defiled the temple by bringing Greeks in there. And we know that this was not the truth. But then did you notice that he also said that we really wanted to handle this with our own form of street justice? Did you pick up on that? Did you pick up? They said, we really were going to handle this with our own form of justice. In other words, we wanted to tear Paul limb to limb. Now, let me tell you, that is not in the Jewish, that's not in the Old Testament. This is a bunch of, this is a bunch of religious people that have made laws and began to practice their traditions and have become so deluded and believed lies instead of standing for the truth. They said, we really wish that your a commander had not interfered, we would have taken care of this by ourselves. In other words, they're saying, we really wanted to kill Paul when we had him and when we had the chance. Boy, that's some fine, outstanding people, isn't it? Would you want to follow somebody in that kind of religion? But that's what they said, even to the governor. Now, Tertullus, in his presentation, he's missing one thing that's very crucial when you go to court. Now, I know some of you here, you've watched these court TV shows, everything from Matlock to Judge Judy to Law and Order to Better Call Saul. I know you've watched all these things, so I know you can answer this. What is the one thing that Tertullus was missing in order to bring about a conviction in this trial? It was evidence. Even if it came in the form of witnesses, He was lacking any evidence. You cannot convict somebody without evidence, even if they did it. O.J. proved that, did he not? They didn't have enough evidence to convict him, and later on he wrote a book called If I Did It. Some of y'all are too young to remember that, so I'll just keep right on moving my mess. Okay. Without enough evidence, he could not prove the lie that Paul had blasphemed the temple. That was the only thing that they really could hold him on charges for. So now Paul makes his defense. Paul becomes his own lawyer. He chooses to defend himself. He doesn't begin with flattery. He doesn't open up with uh, uh, words where he tries to 
impress the governor, but rather he begins to go right to the meat of the matter. And I, this is what you have to do as a believer. This is a great lesson because the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. And there are times in our lives when we are accused and you've got to set the record straight. Amen? You can't allow people to believe a lie. Now, if you're not running in the circle where they're lying, I would suggest just let it go and a lie if, uh, will, will eventually, the truth, God will vindicate you. But if it's something that's impacting your character, your witness, you've got to stand up and say that's not the truth. We were on the islands of Kunayala. There was a man that uh, nobody understood what happened in the middle of the night. We heard, Ajudame, Ajudame, we're sleeping. And all of a sudden, that one of these bamboo huts are on fire. Now, you've got to understand in these villages, if one of these huts catches on fire, it's a danger of the whole island going up in smoke because they're all just dried bamboo thatched hut roofs. And when one catches on fire, it just jumps from one to another until it burns to the ground. We've seen islands burn to the ground. And our men began, and we formed a bucket brigade, and we began to toss fire. And our people actually saved the man and began to treat him and got him on a boat. And got him headed to get treatment. The man was badly burned. And the people began to say, now this was early in our visits. This is early when, what trip was it, Angela? Like maybe our second trip. It was just our second trip. And so the people of the village began to mutter among themselves and began to gather. And so we asked uh, Jerry to ask novice, what were they saying? And he said, they're saying that this happened because of these people here. They're blaming it on y'all. And we had to stand up and confront those people and say, hey, listen, we came and we brought you help. We came and brought you the truth. And we had to set the people straight or else that thing could have risen into a riot. Who knows where it could have gone? Because they have complete jurisdiction over those islands. And it was found out later that the man was stealing gas from our boat and poured it and got the lantern too close and it blew up and actually burned him. And it was, they actually had a, a, a court, a trial there. And so we were vindicated. God vindicated us. But in that moment, we had to stand up for the truth. And you heard me tell the story about how uh, uh, we were on the island just a couple of years ago where the, 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 the chief ruler of the island was a witch doctor. He as much as told me himself. We went to visit him. He told me he was a witch doctor. And then he lied to us and told us we weren't going to be able to have service that evening. And we were praying, and Angela said she felt like she saw Mount Carmel. She saw Elijah confronting the prophets of Baal. I said, well, that's great, Angela, but you're not the one going to confront the prophets of Baal. Y'all better pray for me. So, you know, they prayed for me, and it was a word from the Lord. She had a vision from God. And we prayed, and we prayed that it would be just like Mount Carmel. You know, we went, and I visited that guy, and I just started talking to him. I did not even have to mention that we wanted to have service. He confessed out of his own mouth without me even asking. The Holy Spirit got a hold of him, and he said, y'all can conduct service tonight, and I'll help you clean up a shut-down Baptist church where you can have it at. And we had a tremendous service that night, didn't we, Angela? But there are times that you have to speak the truth in a moment of confrontation. Now, I want you to know I'm a non-confrontational person. I don't like confrontation. Some of you like confrontation. I'm just saying. Some people don't mind confrontation. They don't mind setting you straight. I don't like confrontation. But as a child of God, there are times that you have to declare the truth. Not only to people, but also to demonic spirits that are trying to accuse you in your own mind against what God has spoken and promised in your life. Are you hearing me, church? You've got to arise in that moment and say, no, devil, that's not what God promised me. And so Paul begins to make his case, and he denies that he is... uh, Uh, of the Nazarene sect. In fact, he sets them straight. He says, I belong to the way. How many of you remember back in the 70s, the t-shirts? 
Jesus said, I am the truth, the light. Are you here this morning? Then just every once in a while, you know, just say something or help me out a little bit. How many of you remember the way? Remember those t-shirts with the finger pointing up? The way? Yeah. And so Paul said, I am a part of the way. I am a Christian. I'm not a part of a Nazarene sect. I'm a part of a way that Jesus Christ started. So he defended himself against that. He said, I want you to know that I continue to keep the law. I'm not a lawbreaker. Is there anybody here that still keeps the law? I know we're not under the law, but I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't run around, right? Come on. I'm still a keeper of the law. I believe the law is good. The law is a good teacher. Amen? But we walk by the Spirit, but we're still a keeping the law. And Paul said, I continue to keep the law in spite of what these guys are saying. And he said, I want you to know I did not defile the temple. In fact, I had taken a vow. I had taken an oath. And he said, if there are any witnesses against that, they should have brought them here. Where is their evidence? And when Paul presents his case, he makes it so plain that the governor decides in that moment that he dismisses the uh, court right then. And he says to Paul, he says, Paul, after he adjourns, he said, I will eventually let you go when I hear from Lysias, when I get testimony from him, I'll let you go. Now, this gives you some insight in that Felix, the governor, was a crooked politician because he never did let Paul go. It's only a four-day journey. He kept Paul for two years, right? Why did he keep Paul so long? I have several reasons. The Bible tells us, first of all, He said he did it to do the Jews a favor in verse 27. Did you read it? How many of you remember when they were getting ready to crucify Jesus? This is the same thing Pilate did. Hello? How many of you remember that Jesus, Pilate, kept Jesus arrested instead of letting him go? Even after he said, I find no fault, he said, I did it to do the Jews a favor. How many of you remember that? Same thing spirit of the antichrist that was operating in Pilate, operating in the Sanhedrin, is still in operation against Paul and is still operating in the world today. I'm going to show it to you at the end of this message. The spirit of antichrist is alive and well. But so is the spirit of Jesus. Let me say that. He did it also with financial aspirations. The Bible said he was hoping that Paul would give him a bribe. But then I also believe that one of the reasons he kept Paul was because he was curious about Christianity. I can't prove it, but why would he keep calling him and asking him all these conversations? It sounded like he had many conversations with Paul. Maybe he was hoping to get the bribe, but I really believe he wanted to hear about Jesus Christ. And so in this presentation that Paul makes to uh, Felix, we're going to see a simple formula for success in life. So now, get out that uh, paper there. I want you to get a pen. I want you to follow along with me. Now, let me begin by asking, by you raising your hand, how many of you want to be successful in life? Would you raise your hand, please? Okay, gee. All right, well, maybe, how many of you don't want to be successful in life? Raise your hand. Okay, good. At least nobody raised your hand on that. How many of you don't care? No matter what I ask, you're not going to raise your hand. No matter what I ask, you're not going to raise your hand. Yeah, there's some of you out here. I see you. How many of you want to go to heaven? No, 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 no. I'm mimicking some of the people in the congregation. How many of you want? The pastor said, how many of you want to go to heaven? This might be a trick question. I ain't raising my hand. Who doesn't want to be successful in life? Who doesn't want to be a winner? Does anybody remember the t-shirts that back in the day, born loser? Anybody remember those shirts? You can still order them online. That's where I got it. Natural born loser. Who signs up for that? Anybody want to be a loser? Oh, me, me. I want to be a loser. Loser. Who wants to be a loser? Nobody wants to be a loser. So when I ask you, who wants to be successful in life, everybody raise your hand, whether you mean it or not. I want to be successful in life. God intended you to be successful. 
The Bible said he made you to be the head and not the tail. He said he made you to be the first and not the last. He made you to be above and not beneath. Come on. God wants you to be successful. And so let's look at this simple formula for how you become a success in life. Now, if you notice, there's a premise there. This success that I'm about to talk to you about begins with a basic assumption. And that basic assumption, that premise, in order for the formula to work is that you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can be successful in life as far as making money just by getting two or three jobs. Hello? You're not going to help me this morning. I said, you can be successful in life just by working two or three jobs. You can be successful in life if you earn enough degrees. If you really want to be successful in life, just look at a problem in your community, in your nation, and solve it. Right? That's how, that's, that's how you really become successful in life. You can become successful in this life, but you will never be successful in the spirit realm, in the things of eternity, apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. True success begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about having a relationship where Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. Whenever you hear people say this, Jesus was my Savior, but he wasn't my Lord, and not possible. Jesus doesn't offer that in the Scriptures. The Bible said if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, not Savior. Paul said, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Master? Who are the, you, the one that wants to be the ruler of my life? Jesus is not interested in selling fire insurance. He did not die on the cross to give us a get out of hell free card. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. I can't be doing that bad. Some of what I'm saying has got to be true. He didn't die on the cross and rise from the grave just so you could go to heaven and live like hell on the earth. Come on. Jesus wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants to rule your life. He wants to be your master. He wants to be your Messiah. He wants to be in complete control of your life. And some people say, man, that sounds like a bummer. No, because he can run your life and make a lot more out of your life than you can. The Bible said in him was life and the light The life was the light of all men. Apart from Jesus, you have no light. You might have money, you might have fame, you might have popularity, but you don't have life and you don't have the light. You are living in darkness unless Jesus is the Lord of your life. And this is the premise upon which the formula for success is written. You've got to know Jesus as the Lord of your life. Not just your Savior, but your Savior and your Lord. So now we come to the formula. And the first letter there is A. Notice that it said that Paul talked to him about faith in Christ. If you go back to verse 24, he started off talking about that premise about having faith in Jesus Christ. But then he begins to talk about the formula. It said Paul reasoned with him about righteousness. The scripture says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Once you have a faith in Jesus Christ, he imparts unto you righteousness. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's not based on my good works. It's not based on how well I live my life. It's because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. And so he declares us righteous. Now, let's look at this word righteous. In the Greek, it's a word that I can't say. 
so I'm not even going to slaughter it. It's there on the screen. But in a broad sense, this word righteous means the condition acceptable to God. It means to be right in the eyes of God. But if you look further into the definition, it means virtue, uprightness. And look at the part I've got underlined here. This is what I want to focus on. The word righteous, according to Strong's, is correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. Would you say those words with me? Correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. So when we are saved, God begins a process of working righteousness in us whereby we begin to think correctly, we begin to feel correctly, and out of, as a result of that, we begin to even act in a correct manner. You can have a great marriage. You can have a successful career. You can make a lot of money, but I'm going to tell you, nothing's going to be right unless your attitude is right. Everybody say attitude. attitude. Now write it down on the paper. Attitude. If you want to be successful in life, the first thing you got to get right is your attitude. He talked to him about righteousness, correctness of thinking, rightness of thinking, feeling, and acting. I'm going to tell you, unless your attitude is right, nothing will be right. I'm going to say it again. Unless your attitude is right, nothing will be right. You know how I know? Because I lived it. I've been there. Got the t-shirt. I had a good marriage, had a good family, was pastoring the church. But my mind was riddled with self-pity, rejection, anger. Are you hearing me? So it didn't matter how much success I had with the least little bit of failure or the least obstacle, my default thinking would go back to self-pity. My tude wasn't right. And because my attitude wasn't right, I would begin to think things like, well, no other pastor has to go through what I have to go through. Why does God allow this to happen to me? Why is it always in my church? I'll never be able to accomplish what I want to accomplish. And I just would feed on that. It would just feed my mind. I mean, hourly, daily. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And it wasn't righteous. It wasn't the correct way of thinking. It wasn't God's way of thinking and feeling about things. Amen? How do you know I have the wrong attitude? Your attitude affects everything. Your attitude affects your worldview, how you view the world. Oh, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. That's the way some people view the world. Everything's just going to hell. We just try to, better just try to live the best we can, just hold on as long as we can. That's the worldview that many Christians have. Some people have the view that the world view that everybody's out to get you. Oh boy, you are really, really quiet this morning. I know you're listening, but I, I'm, I'm a feedback pastor. I like to get a little feedback every once in a while. Amen? Somebody help me out. Your worldview, nothing ever goes right. You got to be looking over your shoulder all the time. People are out to get you. That's the world we live in. What is that? That's, you got the wrong attitude. I'm not saying, the Bible said you be as wise as serpents but as harmless as dove. I'm not saying we're ignorant, being Pollyannish and all of that. I'm not saying be stupid. But we can't be walking around waiting for the world to self destruct. Come on. Where's the salt and the light? We're the, we're the people that's going to preserve the world. And if we're looking for the world to just fall apart, fall to pieces, it's because we got a wrong attitude. We do not have a righteous attitude. Amen, pastor. I'll just do it myself since you're not going to do it. Your attitude affects your view of God. You think God's just up there with a big lightning bolt just waiting Waiting for you to make a mistake. 
You think God is a hard judge. That's not God. I had the wrong view of God. I'm pastoring the church. I had a wrong view of God. I'm confessing to you. God was not against me. God was for me. God is a good father. God is the, uh, is the savior. He's the redeemer. He's the deliverer. God is my helper. Amen. He's my strength in the time of trouble. He wasn't against me, but I was blaming God. Your attitude will affect your God view. And most importantly is your attitude will affect how you view yourself. Now listen to what I'm about to tell you because a lot of you don't believe it, but I'm going to say this. Your greatest enemy is yourself. We love to talk about the devil. We love to blame the devil. Oh, the devil did this, and the devil said that, and the devil. But your greatest enemy is your own mind, your own way of thinking, your own attitude. You are your own worst enemy. That's what happened to me. It was myself. No one else goes through what I'm going through. Nobody else understands what I'm going through. Nobody's been through what I'm going through right now. I'm the only one. You know, there's, there's a lot of wrong attitudes in the church that we say, that we repeat, that we teach. There's a lot of things we say that are not righteous. Come on. How many of you have ever heard or said this? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Hmm? Come on now. Don't get quiet on me if, just because I'm talking the truth. How many of you have ever heard or said, I'm just a sinner saved by grace? Is there anybody in the house? Now, now, now let me say this. Maybe at one time you once were a sinner saved by grace. But once you get saved by grace, you're no longer a sinner. Amen? You are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are a new creation, and the Bible said all things become new. Amen? A lot of people think of it like this way. Here's this chair, and this chair is all crippled up. See how bent up? It's got that bent leg. And, and how many of you would want to sit in this chair? Well, see, a lot of us look at this, our old lives as being like this chair. We were messed up, jacked up, not fit to be used. And then we came to Jesus. And here's what a lot of people think. A lot of people think that Jesus came along and Jesus fixed me up. Man, Jesus braced me up and, and he came along and he, he kind of helped me out. And he put things on me and turned me around and did some things for me. And so now... He kind of made me into a, a better version of my old self. And they think that Jesus just kind of made you a better version of who you used to be. He patched me up. And they think that they're basically the same old self that Jesus kind of fixed up some areas of their life. That's not, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible said that my old man was crucified with Christ. This old thing has been done away with. I'm not the old jacked up, propped up person that I used to be. Instead, he said, you are a brand new creation. You're not a sinner saved by grace. You are a new creation, made anew in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He didn't just patch you up. He didn't just make a better version of you. He made you a brand new you. You got to get this in your mind. You're not the same old man. I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. Well, why do I still sin then? Well, because you're human, that's why. You're going to sin, but that old sinful nature no longer has dominance in your life, according to what Paul said in Romans 6 and 6 and chapter 7. Amen. Do I have a witness? The reason you still sin a lot of times is because you got the wrong attitude. 
you got the wrong thought life. You're saying things like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You can't be a sinner and a new creation at the same time. Amen? You can't be the old carnal man and be the new man at the same time. You can't be the spiritual man that God made you new in Christ Jesus and be the fleshly man at the same time. Hallelujah. Newsflash, the old man is dead. Hallelujah. Ding dong, the old man is dead. Quit breathing life and speaking life into your old man and began to speak life into the new creation that God made you to be. I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not a sinner. I'm a born-again child of God, made new. Amen? So the A is attitude. you got to get right thinking. Most of us, our thinking is our biggest problem. You meditate on things. You think about negative things. You concentrate on them, and you let them rule and dominate your mind. That's why the Bible said you've got to renew your mind through the Word of God. The problem we've got in the church is we have too many biblically illiterate people. They don't know what the Word of God says, so the devil can come along and tell them any old kind of lie, and they'll believe it because they can't refute it with the Word of God. Paul did not have one moment's trouble standing up and saying, let me tell you the truth. I belong to the way. you got to know the word. you got to speak the word. You don't have to quote it New King James Version, but you've got to know the word well enough that you can speak it in the time when you're being tested. you got to be renewed in the attitude of your mind. Amen? And then it said that Paul reasoned with him Not only about righteousness, which we equate with attitude, but it said that Paul reasoned with him about self-control. Does anybody believe we could use a little bit more self-control in the world? Huh? Man, people going nuts on the highway, blowing the horn. My wife, just a few weeks ago, she don't even know what she did. A guy pulls up beside her and points his finger like, I want to kill you. People are crazy. Lacking self-control. Well, I've watched kids in grocery store. The, the mom took the eye tablet away from them. They went nuts. I told my wife, I said, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> this, this, this little gal was just screaming and screaming and screaming. I said, you know, give me three days and one of my mama's switches. I believe I could break her. I might end up in jail, but I believe I could break her. Just one of them blood curdling screams, you know. Self control. The word in the Greek is a gracia, the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions. Now, look, it didn't say Jesus masters your passions. It says, it's the virtue of one who masters his own desires and passions. Lots of things that I want to do, I don't do. When my flesh rises up, that we, have, we have to practice self-control. Amen? What was he talking about when he was talking about self-control? He was talking about behavior. Write it in. B is for behavior. B is for behavior. Psalms 1 and 6. Oh, let me go back. Unhealthy attitudes produce unholy behaviors. If you don't get your attitudes right, your behaviors aren't going to be right. If you don't get your thinking right, If you don't get your feeling right, your behavior is not going to be right. Amen? Amen. Unhealthy attitudes produce unholy behaviors. For the Lord knows the way. How many of you know the way is talking about behavior? The way of the righteous, 
Righteous means being right with God, but also God thinking, good, correct thinking, feeling, and acting. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now, let me tell you, perish is not a successful word. So we need to become godly in the way we think, in the way we act, and we need to practice self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5.22. In other words, this is what having the Spirit living inside of us produces. Fruit is what the tree produces. If you have the Spirit of God, anybody got the Spirit of God living in you? Come on, is there anybody here, you know you've got the Spirit of Christ living in you? Amen? This is what the Spirit produces. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, self-control. This is the fruit. This is the behavior. This is the activity that the Spirit of God creates in you. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't act in the way your flesh wants to act. That's why we need the Spirit of God. You have the Spirit of God living within you to help you understand, I don't have to get mad just because somebody cut me off on the highway. I don't have to say, well, they made me mad. See, a person that lacks self-control can say, well, they made me mad. They, they made you. I, I used to love to say that all the time. Well, they made me mad. No, they acted foolishly, but I made the choice to get mad. I've learned I don't have to always say things back now. It's hard. I'm not saying I do it all the time. But we have the Holy Spirit as a helper. He helps us change the way we think. He gives us the power to overcome so that we can walk in victory. We can walk in success. Now, let's go back to our formula. A plus your attitude plus your behavior equals, anybody want to take a guess? Character. That's right. It equals your character. Attitude plus behavior equals your character. Your moral qualities. What one believes, what one stands for, what they post on their Facebook page. Oh, no, no, that's not right. <laughs> what one, one governs their life choices. Your character is who you are when nobody is watching. That's your true character. And what does character lead to? Character leads us to our destiny. What is destiny? Destiny is the future of God's divine will and wisdom that he has for you as an individual. It's the fulfillment of one's purpose. It's the call of God upon your life. Everyone here has a destiny. I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to tell him you have a destiny. Now, we all share a common destiny, whereas we are part of the kingdom of God, we're going to heaven. We all have a shared destiny in that we will one day stand before God, but we also each have our own unique destiny. And your unique destiny contributes to the overall destiny of a church that contributes to the overall destiny of a city that impacts a nation. That's why it's important for you to fulfill your destiny. If you don't fulfill your God-given assignment, there's a piece missing in the church, in the body of Christ, that might be, how many of you remember the old saying, for lack of a nail, the shoe was lost? Come on. I know it's not in the Bible, but it's a good saying. For lack of a shoe, the horse was lost. Right? For lack of a horse... The rider was lost. For lack of a rider, the, the war. Is it just me and you? You never heard that? Oh, my word. Well, maybe that Berkeley County education wasn't so bad after all. There's a saying then. Let me, let me educate you all. There's a saying that says, for lack of a nail... The shoe was lost. You know, horses wear shoes, horseshoes. 
They're not just for playing. Horses actually wear. For want of a nail, one little nail, a shoe was lost. Because the shoe was lost, the horse was lost. Because the horse was lost, a rider was lost. And because that rider was missing, the battle was lost. What is my point? You might just be the nail. But fulfilling your destiny helps push the nail into the horseshoe of the church. And then the church becomes a part of the horse known as the body of Christ in Charleston that can house the rider Jesus Christ in the battle in the city of Charleston to win this city for the glory of God. I'm not giving up on this city. Amen. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give God praise. Hallelujah. So your destiny is the future. God's will for you. Everybody has a God-given destiny. Everybody has a gift. I'm looking at Tina on the back row. I'm looking at Ashley on the front row. Everybody, regardless of your age. And let me tell you, the sooner you find it, the more you can do with it. But regardless of your age, you can still find it and you can still fulfill it. It's never too late in the kingdom. Amen? Now, we see, now the story's going to take kind of a bad turn because we see the character and the destiny of Felix revealed when Paul talks about him about the judgment to come. There is a judgment to come. There is a judgment to come. There is coming a judgment to this world. Jesus Christ is going to come back. He's going to rule on this earth for a thousand years. And then this world is going to be destroyed. And then after that, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But everybody is going to stand before God. Now, the sinner is going to stand before the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. And they're going to be judged, first of all, Because their names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's go back to the premise. If you don't know Jesus, you're in trouble. You need to know Jesus as your Lord. Don't let another day pass without knowing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. This is our job. This is why we're here. We need to help as many people know the Lord as possible. This is why we exist as a church. It's helping people to come to know Christ. And then they're going to be judged according to their works. But church, do you realize that also we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ? And every man's works will be caused to pass through the fire, Paul said in one place. And so he began to talk to Felix about the judgment to come. And this is when we see the true character of Felix was revealed. He was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because he didn't know Jesus. As I talk to you about Jesus coming back and he could come back in the twinkling of an eye, as we talk about the judgment of Christ, if you get afraid, something's not right. You need to make sure Jesus is the Lord of your life. Amen? Felix was afraid. He revealed his character. He did not know Christ. He continued to live a manipulative, lying, destructive lifestyle. Lied to Paul, kept him in prison for two years. We saw his true character revealed when he talked about the judgment of Christ. And then we also saw his destiny revealed. He said, go away. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. His destiny was one that was postponed. He procrastinated. He waited for a convenient season that as best as we could tell from the scripture, never came. We have a problem in America because we repeat and echo the words of Felix. We want to serve God in a convenient time. Well, when the kids get a little older, I'll go on the encounter. Maybe, uh, maybe the next time it comes around, we just keep procrastinating, keep putting it off. Well, maybe when this time comes, You'll never be successful in life being a procrastinator. And let me tell you, if you're waiting for a convenient season to come to prayer time at 5 o'clock, you're going to be like Felix. 
Let me just sit down and let that settle over the mammoth crowd. That didn't go over well, Chad. Five o'clock, see, that's about time I'm taking a nap. That's my family time, pastor. What do you think the rest of us are doing? You don't think the rest of us don't get up from a nap to come pray? It's not about convenience. Now, now listen, don't come to prayer because I just said that. Just come to prayer if you feel like the Holy Spirit wants you to be here. Because if you're only coming because I'm saying it, you'll come. I know what you'll do because I've done this many times. You'll come for two or three weeks and you'll go right back to your same behavior. We want Christ without a cross. We want salvation without a sacrifice. We want holiness without a commitment. We want to serve the Lord without any kind of accountability. It's an American form of the gospel that's not true to the scripture. There is no convenient gospel. It will require everything you have within you. He says, serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, not just for an hour, not just for when it's convenient. You're not going to help me. You're not going to help me. I know you're not going to help me. You know why? Because we, most of us live by the convenience of our own schedules. If it doesn't fit in our schedule, don't expect me to show up to a meeting on Saturday. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to show you that a very evil man said, I'll do it when it's convenient. And Christianity is not about convenience. In fact, Jesus said, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. The cross was an item of torture. It was heavy. It was cumbersome. It was not convenient for Jesus to carry the cross. But we're living in an age where we pick and choose what we want to do when it's convenient for us. And we wonder, and we wonder why we're not seeing change in the church, why people aren't being healed. Why, people, why, why is the community getting worse and worse? It's because the church has adopted the same mindset as Felix. Get away, and, and let me just consider it when I have a convenient season. Simple formula for success. Say it with me. Attitude plus behavior equals character that leads to destiny. You stand to your feet, please. Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest painters, painter of the Sistine Chapel, painted this beautiful rendition of the Lord's Supper. Everybody recognize it? We've all seen this picture. Many of you are already aware of this. At the opening of the Paris Olympics, they had their own rendition of the Lord's Supper. This person here with the aura, the crown around her head, is a Jewish lesbian. Seated to her right and to her left are transvestites, transsexuals, transgenders. There's a man that actually had a part of his personal genitalia exposed intentionally, not accidentally. It was not a wardrobe malfunction. And here is a little child. How many of you remember years ago, I told you what they're after is our children. And they danced and they paraded around, and this lady took this picture, this mockery, of one of the most sacred things that all Christian churches, Catholics, Pentecostals, Baptists, that we all have in common, the Lord's Supper, took and made mockery of it. This lady here posted on her website the Gay Testament. 
the gay testament. There was such an outrage of Christians when this happened that she, they made her take it down and she put down the festival of Bacchus. Now, Bacchus was, a, 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 or Diocinus was a, a Greek god that they were supposedly celebrating that uh, had wine and orgies. They said no offense was intended. How do you know the devil's a liar and the father of lies? How come this didn't mimic like a Buddhist temple? How come it didn't uh, mimic like uh, when they're worshiping Allah? Because the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. But church, here's what we got to understand. The devil's going to do what the devil's going to do. That does not stop us. We can't now say, oh, my God, look how bad it's getting. And plus, let me tell you, God can do a pretty good job of defending himself. Within 24 hours, now y'all know this is Paris, right? This was the scene in Paris. Right around midnight, they had a blackout. The very region where all that parade and all took place, there's one light shining up on the distant hill. Can you see it? That is actually the church of the sacred heart of Jesus. Everything else was in darkness, just like at midnight when the death angel came. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And during the blackout, the energy uh, people of France said they think it was sabotage, and they did the research. Nobody sabotaged anything. Well, they think it might have been caused by the high winds because of the heat. Well, they found out none of the equipment was broke down because of winds or high heat. So they came out and they said that there was an unknown uh, uh, technical difficulty that caused the blackout. Let me tell you what that is. That's jargon for God shut down Paris. God turned the lights off. Now, what you need to understand is right beneath this church is a place in France called the Moulin Rouge. Yeah, some of you know what that is. It's like the red light district. This church, since the 17th century, has been praying for the souls of men and women that are in Moulin Rouge, and lately they have been praying for the reversal of the celebration of Pride Month in June. And because of that, when everything else went dark, God saw fit to keep the church of the sacred heart of Jesus lit up for everybody to see. I want you to know that in the same way, the devil will try to destroy your destiny. But most of all, you are your greatest enemy when it comes to fulfilling your destiny. But the Lord wants to unlock your destiny. The Lord wants you to fulfill your destiny. God has a call and a purpose upon your life. And in this meeting right now, in the name of Jesus, lift your hands up. Let me pray a blessing over you right now. Receive as much as you can of what I'm about to say. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are unlocking destinies in this moment. And just like the devil paraded himself in front of all of Paris, Lord, you struck and you showed that my church will still be the church, my ecclesia, my called out ones, my anointed ones. And I speak to the destiny of every person in this church. And I speak to the call of God upon your life. And I don't care what you're facing. I don't care the depression, the agony, the misunderstanding, the struggle you're having. You have a call and a purpose. And right now, it's rising up by the Spirit 
of the living God. Now, if you know you've got a destiny, why don't you begin to just lift your hands and begin to speak into your destiny? Some of you speak about your children. Uh, some of you speak about your job. Uh, some of you speak about your witness. Begin to speak into it right now. Begin to prophesy. Begin to declare, Lord God, my children will be saved. Uh, Lord, this church will grow. This church is going to be filled. Uh, Lord, the prophecies uh, that you said concerning my life, Lord, they will come to pass. The word is going to spread throughout Africa, throughout Kunayala. There are souls uh, that are being won into the kingdom because of your glory, because of your name. Uh, we declare in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come on this earth as it is in heaven. I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you, stop looking for something wrong to happen. Listen now. Because we know that there is a great shaking coming to the earth. The Bible says so. The Bible, we're, we're living in the times now. There's wars and rumors of wars. We know that. But if we withdraw as the church, how are we going to impact the culture? You have to have the peace of God. You've got to walk in the power of God. You have the anointing of God. You have the word of God. Go and impact the culture. Don't be afraid. Don't let the things that are shaking cause you to be shaken. You are like Daniel, that when he was put in Babylonian captivity, he did not uh, adjust to the culture, but the culture adjusted to Daniel. Daniel refused to bow. Daniel refused to eat the king's meat. And before it was over, Nebuchadnezzar said, there is no God like Daniel's God. He serves the one true and living God. Let us be Daniels uh, that affect our culture, that change our neighborhoods uh, for the glory of God. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to have your way right now. We ask you right now, Holy Spirit, to have your way. Seal the work. Seal the word of God. Lord, I pray for attitudes right now. I pray for stinking thinking. I pray, dear God, for wrong motives. I pray, dear God, for lustful thoughts. I pray, dear God, for self-centeredness. I pray, dear God, about self-pity. I pray against anger. Lord, I pray, dear Lord, that your spirit would begin to work. I pray for liberty of thought. I pray, dear God, for righteousness in our minds. I pray for righteousness, oh God, that we would be clothed in righteousness, uh, that we would think and feel and act uh, in a godly way. I pray for self-control. I pray that our behaviors uh, would line up with the word of God, that people would say, now that's a right man. That's a righteous woman. That's somebody that doesn't... Uh, drink, that doesn't smoke, that doesn't curse. There's something different about that person, Lord. And God, let it be because of the glory of the Lord. I pray, dear God, that we will be carriers of your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, wherever we go, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody take your hand and just draw a circle around your hands like this. Everybody just draw a circle around yourself right now. And just say, say it aloud, this is my world. Wherever I go, my world goes with me. The anointing that's in my world goes with me. The power of the Holy Ghost that's in my world goes with me. The Spirit of Christ Jesus is in my world, goes with me everywhere I go in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Carry him with you. Carry him with you. Go with him with you. Go in the blessings and the favor of our God. Hallelujah.